irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to On Air with Russell of Hotels, only on L.A. Talk Radio. with Russell of Hotels, where we talk about everything hospitality, from hotels to influencers and everything in between. We will feature guest interviews with hospitality professionals who will share their experiences. Your host, Russell Edmond, has spent over 25 years in the hospitality industry, beginning his career with Marriott International in hotel operations, before moving into the sales arena and becoming a relationship building director of sales and marketing. Russell then went to the other side as a hospitality entrepreneur. He now consults in the hotel and meeting space, which includes being the CEO of Russell of Hotels Group. Did I mention he was a veggie foodie? Yes, Russell is always looking for good non-meat eats. Please welcome your host, Russell Edmond. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining On Air with Russell of Hotels. Today's Tuesday. You know what that means? Well, it's, my show is on, and it's Taco Tuesday, right? So, uh, you know, today, later, I'll be making tacos today. Today, I think I'm going to do some cauliflower tacos just for myself, and then, you know, we'll, we'll get regular meat for the, for the regular people, okay? So... Uh, I'm, I'm here. We're live. We're in Sherman Oaks. Um, if, if you're on uh, Facebook Live, you can see that I do have a guest today, and that's Miss, Mr. Amani Roberts, DJ extraordinaire. But uh, we're going to introduce him later. I told him <laughs> that, you know, you know I'll, I'll mention him, but, you know, he, he's a veteran and all this stuff. And we're going to get to all that stuff because this, this guy is something else. So we're just talking about... Um, some of the things, one of the 12 jobs that he has, <laughs> right? And some of the things that he, he's a, he's a, a adjunct professor at uh, Cal State uh, Fullerton. And we're talking about some of the coursework because I didn't exactly know what he's teaching. So he told me a little bit of it. And man, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if I want to take that class. It went back in the day when I was in school, but, be but, fine. Uh, but, be uh, fine. but no, it was, it was definitely good. And I, I didn't realize he was actually teaching certain things. So, but we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that. So, but once again, thank you uh, so much for joining on air with Russell Hotels. Uh, today's Tuesday at one o'clock. We are a live show. And just remember, after it becomes a live show, it, we become a podcast. So wherever you're available or where, whatever platforms you listen to, uh, your favorite platform or your favorite podcast, we're on there. So just on air with Russell Hotels. So this show will be uh, on there as well, as, as well as the other, I think, 23 shows I've done. Uh, thus far can you believe that 24 shows already congratulations yeah thank you but you know what that's nothing compared to this this hold on <laughs> hold on to your hat here so uh we as always i have some industry news before we get into the interview so so there's a couple of things that i wanted to mention and it's funny because last week i didn't have a lot to because uh, you know i start looking at industry news you know after the last show um aired so i'm starting gathering things or whatever but then I didn't have a lot, but I was trying to make stuff up. And then all of a sudden today I come up with like, I don't know, 20 things that, that, that are industry news. Not 20 things, but more than I had before. El Dorado Resorts just purchased uh, Caesars. I don't know if you know that, but um, they, the deal was valued at $17.3 billion. This will increase El Dorado Resorts from se up to 79 casinos now. And of course, will you know um, uh, increase their presence in Vegas. So El Dorado, if you guys remember, two, three weeks ago, I had Miss Amanda Berry from Reno. OK, she was with uh, it was called the Row Hotels, which one of those hotels was the El Dorado. Mm -hmm. So that company bought Caesars. So hopefully that's a lot of good, uh, um, you know, maybe some good career growth for Miss Amanda Berry. A promotion. Out, right? Hello. Yeah, something's <laughs> going on. Right. So so that's good. So congratulations to. 
El Dorado Resorts for, you know, purchasing Caesars. And uh, congratulations to Amanda for being in the right place at the right time, I think. So hopefully it all works out. Um, and you heard about that here on on air with Russell Fotel. So, I mean, where else are you going to get this information from? We're Hospitality Unplugged, right? So what is that? You know, hashtag Hospitality Unplugged. What the heck does that really mean, right? What does that mean to you? It means any and everything that's included in hospitality, what you hear about in the news, what you don't hear about in the news. Exactly. So, yeah. So I'm getting some inside information, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Too, right. A lot yeah. of inside information. A valid source. There you go. A va- thank you. Thank you. A valid source. So, you know, and I always say just because you can say it on the air doesn't mean you should say it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, of course, you know, we're careful about some of the things we say. I'm not trying to blow people out of water or anything like that. That's not what the show is about. It's about getting information. It may be some information you didn't know about before, but it's not personal information about <laughs> specific people. It's about companies that are whatever they're doing, you know, and I think it's newsworthy. So, I mean, you know, no exception is the El Dorado buying Caesar. So something like that that maybe you did not know. Is that going to affect anything? Are they going to change all the Caesars to El Dorados? No, that's not going to be what they're going to do. They're going to keep those hotel Caesars um, because there's there's a name recognition with that as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it would take so much money and so much whatever to to change those things over. And why would they want to do that? So so just, you know, hang tight. If I get any more information, I'll, any more insider information, I'll let you know. Uh, 8,000, oh, no, excuse me, 800,000 bookings were affected by that new cruise restrictions to Cuba. Now, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago because, you know, I know two of the people that are affected by that. I was one of them. OK, yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, for people that didn't have not heard this, um, we had booked a cruise to Cuba that was coming up in July. Yeah. Right. Well, they changed their, you know, the, the government changed the restrictions, meaning cruise ships can't go over there. anymore. Yeah. We had a family cruise, my family cruise. They were going to Cuba. Really? And two weeks ago could not go. They, See, well, then now, you know, See, not you're part they of 800,000 bookings. They were not happy. We weren't happy either, uh, but we're going to Alaska now. So uh, they gave us the money back, which was good. The cruise line, I think it was Princess, gave us the money back. And then we rebooked on an Alaskan cruise, good. which I wanted. That, that was on the bucket list, too. But Cuba was on the, yeah. the, the, the you know, the real main I bucket know. list. We always wanted to go to Cuba. but Give it a couple years. Let's see if something changes. Yeah, well, we'll check this out, though. It's funny <laughs> you should say this. Good segue. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's 12 approved categories of authorized travel to Cuba. Did you know that? No, no. Okay, two of them. I'm just going to talk about the two because the two actually affect me. Professional meetings. You can still go over there on a professional meeting and professional research. I don't know what that is. That's kind of vague. and Sounds like a site visit to me. Thank you very much. (laughs) Check out some hotels. Talk to some students in Cuba. Exactly. Thank you. So there's still a chance to go. You know, I may not be able to take anybody with me, but there's still a chance for me to go. Let's let's, let's plan a conference over in Cuba. So there's still ways to get over there. So, um, So check that out if you guys are interested in you know, any of the restrictions It's called authorized 12 approved categories of authorized travel to Cuba. You probably can Google that and find that information out. Uh, Booking.com charges, you know, they charge hotels, they charge hotels commission on the resort fees. Did you know that? That's interesting. I did not know that. Makes sense. They want to get as much money as they can. Of course. (laughs) Now that's booking.com. Now Expedia currently does not charge, but check this out. What Expedia is doing is working on an algorithm that will rank hotels lower if they do charge for the um, the commission on the um, on the resort fees. Mm. And that's something. Oh, it's trying to get that money, you know, squeeze, exactly. squeeze that. What do you say? Squeeze the money out of a turnip? I don't know the proper saying, but. Squeeze blood out of a turnip. They're trying to get blood out of a turnip, yeah. basically. Yeah. So it just in case you didn't know. So hotels, if you look at Expedia.com, uh, Hotels.com or booking.com hotels are ranked so you look at the first page and you know the top hotels are there maybe i don't know be, before the fold of the page um there may be 10 hotels okay so there's a reason for those to be ranked that high i mean it can be because of they book a lot people book tend to book a lot i mean it could be their ranking some whatever ranking expedia or those um, otas use but what is what what this is saying is that expedia is going to penalize the ones that are basically um, that basically have a resort fee, mm-hmm. but some hotels call it an urban fee, or <laughs> a, I don't know what the heck that means. But 
urban hotels, hotels in the hood, they, they charge more. I, I don't know what urban <laughs> means. What will they think they, of next? Yeah, they come up with all <laughs> kinds of different things. Basically what it includes is like the, the internet, maybe the pool, you know, things like that. They're just trying to get some, like, maybe even valet parking or parking or something like that. So that's what's in those resort and urban fees. So hotels, just remember, you know, check that out. Are you getting charged for, um, you know, when booking.com or, or booking comes through booking.com, are you being charged for the resort fees? You may want to check that out. Uh, let's see. What is that? Uh, did you know? No, 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 no. What is that? Okay. No, I didn't say that. Um, okay. Or what do you think about the urban fees the, and resort fees? You think it's a good thing? No, but I mean, it's just ways for hotel to try to, you know, they, they cut, they're trying to control the costs. They're trying to get as much money as they can. I first really learned about like resorts and in Vegas and now every hotel is kind of implementing something as well. So it's, it's just the nature of the beast. So you got to try to be creative, maybe call, see if they can waive it for you. You can always ask, but yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going through that now. Cause um, I, I'm trying to book a family reunion in Vegas. Right. So, you know, cost is always a concern with a family reunion, right? Well, it's a cost for anything, but it's more of a concern yeah. With a family, right? Because everybody different various uh, budgets and things like that. So, um, so I've been looking at hotels, right? I mean, probably ten hotels, but they all charge, yeah. You know, so the rate could be one hundred and ten dollars, <laughs> but guess what? The, the resort fee is forty dollars. <laughs> so they get their rate back up to exactly. One. So yeah. that's going to be an issue. In fact, we have a meeting this weekend about this. So this is going to be <laughs> something. You know, I hope we don't have to change again. But anyway, you could look at Airbnb. <laughs> no resort fees there. I'm not a fan of Airbnb. Okay. 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 Uh, you know, I put out a just in case you didn't know, I, I I think I copied or posted something about Airbnb. I saw that. Yeah. I didn't. You know, I'm not. They, there's a list of things that they do that I don't like. Yeah. Okay. I don't even want to get the into random it. canceling of reservations is probably the number one issue. But yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, that's a subject for a different show. Exactly. A different we don't want to get into go through a we, whole we, list. We don't need to go through all that. <laughs> Hilton turns 100 this year. Did you know Hilton has 17 brands? They have over 5,700 properties. They have over 923,000 rooms. Didn't someone say, I read somewhere, they're more valuable now than Merritt or something? That I they, said that last week. Yeah. You, you heard my show last yeah, week. Yeah, I said yeah. that last week. Mm -hmm. See, it, people are listening. Yeah. At least one guy here <laughs> listening. Spread the news. It. Exactly. On air with Russell Hotel. We'll find <laughs> all this good information. Uh, CVBs and DMOs. Use them as a resource. Agree, 110%. Okay, I got that from, just so happened, I was looking at something that Ronnie Palma posted uh, this morning, and I said, that's a good one. Let me just go ahead and mention that. Well, so Ronnie Palma, VP of Visit Oakland, uh, she mentioned that. She's been on my show. She was good. on my show uh, yeah. a little while back. So shout out to Ronnie. Um, I won't go into that right there. We can hold off on that. Contact information, Russell, how do you get a hold of me? Um, email Russell at RussellFhotels.com. Twitter at Russell of Hotels. IG at Russell at Russell of Hotels. LinkedIn, Russell L. Edmond. Facebook, Russell L. Edmond. I have two Facebook pages. So Russell L. Edmond and Russell of Hotels is the other one. And of course, my website is RussellofHotels.com. And I already mentioned that after this show, live show, it becomes a um, podcast. Um, you guys know what I do. I don't have to say that. Um, you're on bus. I'm I'm speeding through this one because I want to spend <laughs> as much time with this guy. We gotta get, we gotta put this guy on the hot seat, right? He's just foaming at the mouth over there to, to start talking. I can tell. So, um, who's on blast? Brian Church. You know Brian Church, all right? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna send him a text after this one. He's you know, on blast. This guy's been on blast for a while. He's been <laughs> he's. He, he purposely ignores me. I, we go to these events, and he purposely does not mention that he's on blast. And he knows yeah. that he's on it, right? We're going to take a selfie together. I'm going to text the self and be like, uh, Russell's waiting for you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that Brian, he's something else, boy. He's something else. Brian, just come on the show. What you, you know, just come on the show. We'll talk just like, Monty's one of your buddies. Okay, yes. come on now. Yeah. Mayor Les was on it, too. The crew. You're the last, on. last remaining You're link. the last one. So you need to be on this show, Brian. Uh, Nelly, a.k.a. Foodie Call, she's on the list. Uh, Luis Torres with Universal Studios, you're on the list, Luis. Kenya Stamps, you know Kenya Stamps? Yes. You did her wedding. I did. You should wish her happy wedding anniversary. It's coming up in the next, next in July. Okay, well, happy wedding anniversary to yeah. Kenya Stamps yeah. and her in husband. Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Congratulations. Uh, she's with 
Uh, she's the vice president of sales and service with Long Beach CVB. Yep. So you're on the list, Miss Lady. Okay. <laughs> we'll so. send her the selfie too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Thompson and Matt uh, Diamond. Yeah. Okay. They're with Sync Meeting Management. They manage your meeting. So I can book the meeting and they can manage it for you. There you go. It's a partnership, right? Um, collaboration. That's the buzzword. Collaboration. So Samuel Thompson and Matt Diamond. You are both on blast as well. You know those two gentlemen, right? Yes, I do. Samuel's on my podcast okay. in February. Very good. Very good. So you're, you're getting too far ahead here. We're not trying to talk about that yet. My bad. What are you trying to do? Okay. All right. I'm going to introduce this guy. All right. <laughs> and man, I got to, where are my glasses? I have to, there's so much stuff here. I don't want to leave anything out. But I want to introduce today's guest, um, Howard University grad, this prestigious Howard University in D.C., okay? Um, hospitality professor at Cal State Fullerton. We're going to talk about that. A salsa dancer. <laughs> okay. Plays the piano. <laughs> plays soccer. Newly elected vice president of, well, not newly elected, but is a new position, but he's a vice president of uh, membership currently with MPI Southern California chapter. Music producer. Music curator, curator, curator. Yes. Okay, yes. all right. Social media consultant. <laughs> he's helped me out, and we're gonna get in that. He's helped me out. Uh, DJ extraordinaire. Not to mention, he has just recorded his one hundredth podcast. Yes, yes. So congratulations on Thank that, you sir. Very much. So please welcome Mr. Amani Roberts of the Amani Experience to the On Air with Russell Hotel Show. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me as a guest. I appreciate it. Well, finally, you know, I've been trying to get you on here for a minute, but, you know, if you got 12 jobs, you know, it's hard to get somebody, well, you know. if I'm teaching on Tuesdays all day in Fullerton, it's hard for me to get up here by the proper time. Well, why couldn't we just do it at Cal State Fullerton? We certainly could have. See, see. We, we didn't talk about that. Well, you know, they had this thing called technology they where you do. can do stuff anywhere. But I, right? you know, I want to be in person with you in front of you. So, but yeah, we're he here did now. Say that. He did say that. He yeah. said he want the whole experience. I want the whole experience. So this is it. So I I, I'm it. glad you, you took time <laughs> out to, um, to, to come out and, and hang out with me for an hour or so. Um, but you know, you have done a lot of things. Uh, we met years ago. We both went Marriott, both came through the Marriott system, right? Uh, both have a lot of great things to say about Marriott. Um, but take me through your career progression, if you will. <laughs> okay, long. So I'll make it as short as possible. I started, um, if you remember back in the day when we used to have cashiers for banquets. You have a cashier <laughs> at the bar. Yes, yeah, I, I was a freshman that. in college at Howard, and I was working for Holiday Inn Crown Plaza as a cashier. So I did that for like six or nine months through the holiday season. Then I went to go work for Marriott as a bellman. Worked my way through Marriott, was a bellman, front desk clerk, then went to corporate headquarters, worked there for a year or so. And then I moved to Atlanta, worked during the Olympics, 96 Olympics, then went to Chicago, worked in a courtyard as assistant general manager, then went to Dallas, Texas as an opening general manager, of Town Place Suites by Marriott. So I was 23 years old as a general manager. Wow. Quite young, yes. very young. And did that for a year and a half, opened up the hotel. Um, we opened up with a pretty high occupancy, did very well our first year. And that's where I fell in love with sales. So okay. from there, I went to Miami. Okay. Moved to Miami, Biscayne Bay, Mary. I did sales there. Loved it. Loved that city. Then I moved back home to D.C. area um, and did sales in a couple positions, Crystal Gateway Marriott. Then I became a director of marketing in Bethesda. Was there for like four and a half years and moved out to L.A. Director of marketing at Renaissance Montour. Was there for a year and a half, two years. Then went to Marina Del Rey Marriott as the director of marketing. And then regional director of sales and marketing during the Salesforce One. That was my last position with Marriott, and then I decided to retire and pursue my DJ career and other ventures full-time. And so that's kind of what I've been doing full-time since 2000 and, let me think here, I think it was like 2012. Okay. You've and been here since 2012? I've been in LA since 2007. Okay. I've been doing full-time DJ since 2012. I started DJing in 2008. Wow. And so... That kind of, I mean, there's lots that's happened in between there, of but course, that's kind of, of course. No, leads us to today, so I've, to speak. I haven't had anybody go through a career that, that quickly. Because <laughs> <laughs> we want to get to the good questions. <laughs> now, Marriott moved you around a lot. They did. Yes, I, um, I grew up in Marriott hotels. You know, I was a kid, 17 years old when I started, 18 years old when I started with Marriott. And so moved me around to all these different cities. I met some wonderful people, learned so many skills. Um, and so it was just, it was fun. It was exciting. 
moving to different cities where you know one person, that's pretty daunting. But because I had Marriott, you know, moving me, at least I had the staff I was working with or exactly. working for me. So that was good. They paid. And I just got exposed to different areas of the country. And it was a great experience and forever grateful. Definitely. Very good. Now, would you go back to the East Coast? Well, I still have family in the East Coast, but I like living here in Los Angeles. My business is kind of set up here. I want to try to work my business where I can actually work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. as I can just go and do gigs anywhere because a lot of what I do is mobile. But I'm pretty happy here. I'll go back and visit the East Coast, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty good out here. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, we need you out here. We're going to need you back there. So uh, explain to me, because this is on your podcast, and of course I listen to your podcast. Thank you. Going from the uh, corporate space to the creative space. Yes. What does that mean? That means it takes my journey. Like I worked for corporate Marriott for almost 20 years mm -hmm. and um, I started doing some creative work, whether it be the DJing early on, like uh, when I was still 2008. And I think that a lot of people who are in the corporate space have a fear of leaving. They want to do something more creative, but they're scared to leave and pursue it just because of maybe economics or they're scared of failure. Just they don't know what they will do. And I, my goal of the podcast is share individual stories of people who've done the same thing. And I think it's important for us to hear other people's stories so that we can become inspired. We can be like, oh, you know, I heard that, you know, Seiko did this and he's successful. Or Jamie, you know, she used to work in retail. Now as a yoga instructor, she's successful. Or, you know, someone who used to work and sell, KJ Rose, used to work and sell uh, pharmaceutical sales and has gone on to be an extremely talented performance coach. Like those stories are out there so that people can identify with them and say, you know what, I want to go for it. And that's the goal for the podcast, and that's kind of the tagline where it comes from because it mirrors my story. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely love it. I love your story, of course, and then just hearing anyone else's story. And if you're an entrepreneur, I mean, you you think you're out there on this island by yourself, yeah, yeah. but um, but no, you're, you're, there's other people, other creatives that are out there. Now, being a creative, I mean, meaning you're, start, you're creating everything from start to to finish right you're doing your own marketing you're doing all Everything. those things until you get to a level where you can hire certain people to assist mm -hmm. you kind of hire out things like elizabeth gilbert says she's one who wrote big magic one of my favorite books and eat pray love everyone is creative they might not realize it yet but every mm -hmm. person is creative so i just think that if you can find the resources and if i can help people find the resources or inspiration to pursue their creativity then that makes me happy yeah, so this guy, he has helped me out on the social media tip for, I mean, for years now, right? My last two hotels, uh, he would come, with, I think, about the Sportsman's Lodge yes. and then um, at the Sheraton. Correct. Yeah, he would come in and kind of look at what we're doing social media-wise and tell, tell me what I should do. This is what you should do. First of all, he got me involved in social media. I yeah. wasn't even doing it for a while. Exactly. Uh, and, and then he got me in that. And I have to say, first of all, shout out to Russell for giving us our first summertime residency at the Sportsman's Lodge. After I graduated from Scratch Academy, had us up there for, I think it was eight weeks, the pool party. So yes. thank you for that. That goes down in our history, myself and DJ Flossie. And then when I first started working with you, you, you had like no followers. Like you didn't really kind of know about hashtags. We had a long conversation about hashtags, anything. And I told you about LinkedIn because I thought that'd be a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. And if we look on LinkedIn now, you've got like almost 20,000 people that are following you on LinkedIn. No, 25,000. Oh, see, there, see, I see, <laughs> see, I set you up. I set that up. <laughs> but I mean, the progress that you have made, just listening to what I shared and learning on your own and going to conferences and meetups and talking to people. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like you have grown your own personal brand on social media in a relatively short period of time because it was only two or three, maybe four years ago when we sat in the Sheridan and sat at Sportsman Lodge and talked about you. And I mean, I know we wanted things kind of right away, mm -hmm. but the progress that you have made over these short amount of time is, is inspiring. It's good. So I got to give you credit for listening and putting things, you know, applying what we shared. Well, thank you. Now, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the push. You know, every <laughs> now and then we need a push, right? So he definitely would, you know, I kind of felt bad not doing it. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> He had all these followers. I'm like, well, you know, that was a goal. I said, I'm going to try to get to at least where he is. He got well, more I, than me. Yeah, <laughs> I surpassed him. And I try to tell him, I said, you need to up your game. Right. I, I take it. But, you know, a lot of, you, sh you know, you share ideas or tech tactics or things with people and they don't do it. Like they listen and don't do it. But you applied the lessons and that that made me happy. I was like, wow, at least, you know, it's worth my time. Yeah. No, and definitely. then we kept meeting periodically and talking through things. So props to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you, you know, taking the time and, and, and doing that. So now you mentioned Scratch Academy. Yes. What the heck is that? Scratch Academy is like going to college for DJing. I love it. I went there. I took a class. One of my best friends in life, Josh, he went there the semester before me and said, you know, 
I know you're DJing, but if you go to Scratch, that can help you really kind of become a better DJ, build your foundation. So I went to one class. It was July 2012. And I went to one class one night and it was like, whoa, like I have a lot to learn. So I signed up for the whole program. So you go through the entire program. It's about a year long. You take six classes. You have to pass each class. Um, you have an elective and you go through all the classes and you get to the final class, which is like uh, mixing 505 is what they used to call it. And you go through and you do different sets. Like you do a lounge set. You do a prime time set. Lounge is like what you play in a hotel lobby or kind of hip. Mm -hmm. Prime time is what you're playing. Peak time at the club. Where everyone's dancing. Opening when you're opening up for a headline DJ or a headline artist, and then prime time with requests. You go through all these sets, you get scored. You have to get, um, and then you have the final exam. So you work your way up, and then the final exam is like 100 points, and you have to graduate and get 320 out of 400 to pass and get your gold platinum record, and you graduate. Mm -hmm. It's pretty serious. Like, it's no joke. The first time through the program, I get to the last class, I go in, and I get a 318 out of 400, mm. and they don't pass me. And wow. I'm used to being a high achiever, all-state mm -hmm. soccer player, mm -hmm. general manager at 23. Like, I'm used to being top of mm -hmm. the top. And this was, this was a turning point in my career because I had the decision to make whether or not um, I'm going to take my ball and go home, mm -hmm. forget about it, or I'm going to swallow my pride and go back and take the final class again and, and keep going. And I always talk about that. I talk about that in the book that I'm writing as, as like one of the turning points. Didn't know that. Wait a minute. Don't try to just <laughs> slip that by me. Wait a minute. You're working on a book? Yes, yes. I'll, yes, I'll tie it up really nicely okay, here. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> keep going. So um, I made the decision to, you know, just go back. I ended up getting one of the highest scores ever in the class and passed. And actually, the instructor, the director of the program, usually he doesn't say much when people graduate. He just says, nice job. I enjoyed working with a student. But for me, he kind of talked for an additional two, two minutes just about me and how the leadership I showed and how um, I, was, I persevered through it, which meant a lot. So sometimes when I have a tough day, I'll look at that video because it's really good to remind me of how far I've come. And um, yeah, so I passed. And then a year later, I went back. They had a music production school. So I went back to music production school and passed that one straight through the first time. Didn't have to, didn't fail anything there. So I did well with that. And that's when I started producing music. And like I've, I've produced now, I have a remix partner. We've produced two different 10 to 11 song remix EPs. We're mm -hmm. halfway through our third EP, different remixes. I have a CD for you, by the way. It's a little gift I brought for you. So okay. yeah, good. that <laughs> and um, yeah. So all my experience in Scratch and I talk about my, in the book, the book that I'm writing is, um, I guess the working title is maybe 1001. And that's what I do is I relate the time slots of a DJ set, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m to different stages of business. So for example, 10 o'clock to 10.15, you're just starting out the DJ set, you kind of get in to feel the crowd. Same thing in business, you're just starting a business, trying to find your customers, mm -hmm. relate to mm -hmm. them. You keep going to maybe 11 o'clock, something goes wrong in the business, something always goes wrong in the DJ booth, either a speaker goes out, power, computer messes up. How do you continue to keep your business running? How do you continue to keep the music running and not have anything stop but still fix the issue? Then you get to prime time, midnight, whereas you know the dance floor is packed. You got to keep the dance floor packed. Same thing in business. You got business coming in. You want to keep this streak going as long as possible. So it takes you all the way through the time slots of a DJ set. Um, 1:40, 1:30 p.m. I or a.m. I like to play a lot of slow jams at the end of my DJ sets. So mm -hmm. nostalgia. How does nostalgia fit in with business and how they draw that to increase business? And then after the set is over, there's a chapter on self care because, as you know, in the hospital industry, we work very hard. Mm -hmm. Same thing in um, music and DJing. You got to take care of yourself. So we talk about that, and that's the book. So I'm about halfway through the first edit. So I hope I can finish that, you know, in the next couple of weeks. And then it goes to a copy editor for grammar. And then we start marketing and getting a cover and everything. So, wow. Man, yeah. man, see, that's 13 jobs now. <laughs> now you're writing but the it, book. Every job that I have always fits with the core being DJing. Mm -hmm. It all fits. And so, yeah, there we go. Long wow. answer to a Short question. No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> We're on air uh, with uh, Russell Hotels, and our guest today is Mr. Amani Roberts. DJ extraordinaire. He's just going through, he's already went through his career and we're talking about Scratch Academy and yeah. now we just got an exclusive, an exclusive that he's actually writing the book and halfway through it. Yeah. And that, that's, that's amazing. That sounds pretty good. That, that, I like that. I Thank like you. that. Yeah. So yeah, I'll be sure wait. to get you a copy, a signed copy. Yes. Yes. Um, and I don't read, but I'll read that book. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I'll, hopefully after it's going to be on audio too. So hopefully. Okay. Oh, okay. I can do that. Like I no, can do that. November release. I'm hoping uh, October, November. We'll see how it goes. But okay. yeah, 2019 for sure. Okay. Very good. Very yeah. good. Now, okay. You went through Scratch Academy. Now, did that help you get more gigs? 
Ab <clears throat> absolutely. Me. Just the experience I got there, um, whether it be troubleshooting, like I spoke about, how to plan proper sets, how to work your DJ business to, you know, make it uh, more attractive to potential clients. It just really gives me more credibility. Like okay. I've gone to a school for DJing. I know how to MC. I've got the my years of hospitality experience plus going to a DJ school. It just it my my DJ career kind of took off, you know, like on a nice trajectory, and it just really mm -hmm. helped. And and it also opened my eyes up to the possibilities of DJing. You know, when I first thought decided I wanted to be a DJ, I was maybe like a senior in college. Senior how I saw Bismarcky at this club, it was amazing. And I said, you know what, I wanna do that. But I was incorrect in my assumption that DJing is not a legitimate career. I was wrong, it is a legitimate career. There's many different avenues of revenue you can get. And so that really hit home for me when I was at Scratch Academy and my instructors who were teaching, but they were also gigging out, they were also producing. I was like, wow, you know, I just, you know, sometimes things are hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't realize all the possibilities. And that, in addition to helping me grow my DJ business, it, it, my experience at Scratch Academy helped me to think bigger and just recognize that there is possibilities, so it's time to go for it. Now, you have some permanent gigs, right? You still at the Brig? Yes, the Brig. I'll be there this Friday. Yes, the You've Brig been twice there for a month. like years, Since right? Since 2013, <laughs> and I got that gig because a DJ that also went to school at Scratch Academy, graduated before me, would come back to the alumni gatherings, and he said, you know what, um, why don't you come and open up for me at the Brig? And so I opened up for him at the Brig a couple of times and the manager liked what I was playing and they asked me to cover for them like on Wednesday or Thursday a couple of times. Then the Friday night slot opened up, which is a prime time slot for any bar or club. They said, would you like it? And I said, sure. So I was there every Friday for like three years. And then we kind of scaled it back. So I do there like Fridays or Saturday twice a month. And so, yeah, that's been my residency for almost six years. Wow. Good wow. practice. I love to go there and just practice and see what people request and mm. what they what they respond to. So it's it's good training. Okay. Good, yeah. good, good. Now, a couple of years ago, and we mentioned this a little while ago, that um when I needed a DJ, we were opening up a pool at um <laughs> we're doing the what what do we what do you call it? day parties yeah, or pool during... parties or whatever at Sportsman's Lodge, right? Sportsman's Lodge has a huge pool. In fact, they're redoing their pool. It's not even open yet. Okay. Um but um the first DJ I thought of was you thank you i'm like I, and you would have stayed there if they unless i mean until the owners said well can you get some more djs in here or yeah. you want to do like a rotating yeah. thing which yeah. which is fine, fine i understand yeah. but you know at least we got you for eight weeks i appreciate it myself and dj philosophy who's still That's a good right. friend of mine we That's were up right. there so that was the start so i'm always forever grateful yeah thank you no you're welcome <laughs> thank you thank you um so are you, is your company growing? Do you have um, other DJs now that yes. assist you? Yes, I have probably now a good four or five DJs that will, I'll send out on different gigs at the same time that I'm working or if I'm out of town. So that's okay. growing slowly, but sure, I don't want to rush that because I definitely want to make sure quality control is good. Um, but yeah, we're growing. Um, I just finished a gig in Toronto. So now we're kind of stamping our, our international passport where we have Brazil, Toronto. Hopefully maybe I'll get to Denmark or somewhere in the fall, winter area, Canada again. So we're growing in different areas and just different uh, types of business we do because I also, like we did in Toronto, the team building activity we have where it's a DJ lesson, but it's over a team building environment. So it's really interactive, it's unique. And I'm, I'm trying to expand that to where it can be like a keynote session at a, a convention. It can be a breakout. I've done it at a breakout several times at several mm -hmm. conventions as well. So that's one area where we're growing. And so what happened in Toronto was big and it was successful. So that's really good for us. I also teach people individually how to DJ. I have students. I just had one student on Sunday. I have one Friday. So I do individual DJ lessons, also group classes. So the different areas of our business that continue to grow. So together, we're definitely growing and making great progress. Now, before we move on from this, uh, <laughs> can you tell how many people, tell us how many people you did I mean, you did a team building at yes. WC WEC conference in Toronto. Correct. But how many people did you right were part of this team Two, building? 265 people. Is that the most you've ever done? That's the most I've ever done so wow. far. Wow. And that was great. We had one set of turntables up there. I had a co-facilitator, Stephen Foster, who kind of helped me. He came to me with the idea, and it was Chapter Business Summit, which is all the leaders for all the MPI chapters around the world okay. will come into um, the conference before WEC starts, and you get kind of training and best practices on kind of your department, whether it be membership, what are other chapters doing to improve their membership, education, communications. And what we did is we uh, kind of created an atmosphere where the theme was around songs and music. 
And so people had to create their DJ name. Everyone in the audience, 265 <laughs> different DJ names. They had to create their DJ name. Then they had to name their individual table. They had to view their table as like a record label. Mm -hmm. And so they had to pick a record label name for their table. So once again, it's just created creativity here, creativity there. Then they had to decide a song that would resonate and be kind of their theme song for the year. And so what we did is we went through that. People would get up on stage. And you know, you're not as scared of the microphone, but 9 out of 10 people are more scared of uh, a microphone than they are of dying. Mm. And so they get up on stage, maybe <laughs> talk on the microphone, explain their DJ name, explain their record label name. We went through all that. We came up with a top 10 list of the best songs that were submitted in terms of theme songs. We announced that at the end, give awards for the most creative DJ name, most creative record label name. And so... That was the beginning and the end. And in the middle, we had different departments talking about best practices. Um, they trained on how to do certain things. So we were able to kind of combine the whole activity and accomplish the goals that MPI Global had for the Chapter Business Summit as well. And so the feedback we got was really good because most of the time, those meetings are just people talking at you and not really interacting. Exactly. This one was highly interactive. People were digging it. They still would call themselves their DJ name days later. <laughs> really? um, yeah. It was really effective. So I'm, I'm excited cool. and I'm, I'm happy that it worked. So that's what that was about. Wow, that's great. So now you're worldwide because there's people from all over that go to that conference. Exactly. Right? Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now you take your show on the road too if you need to. Yes. Yes. I do. I've done podcast interviews in um, Chicago. Did I do one in Toronto? I didn't do one in Toronto, but D.C., Chicago, Atlanta, Vegas. I've done podcast interviews everywhere. Okay. okay. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Very good. <laughs> now, okay. Let's, well, we got to get into this one. Okay. <laughs> now, you're a professor. Correct. At Cal State Fullerton. Yes. Now, it's been not a year yet, right? Is, a year. Has it been a year already? A year. Wow, congratulations on making that year. Thank you. <laughs> so, first of all, tell us what you're teaching. Okay. And, um, and just how do you like it? Do you like it? So, I teach in Mahalo School of Business and Economics. I teach a class called Entertainment Money Management, BUAD 360. What we learn in this class is we learn how different venues make money. For example, how hotels make money, casinos, amusement parks. We can talk about gaming as well. And then we get into the streaming services, music, Spotify, how the sp artists make money on Spotify, YouTube, uh, Apple Music. We talk about the streaming services like Netflix and Hulu, how they earn revenue. And then movies, films, how do films make money? Most of it's top line. We don't get into the cost too much because that gets too granular. Mm -hmm. But it's mostly top line revenue. And then careers that are involved with the different either hotels, Spotify, YouTube, movies. And I love it. It's an amazing experience. It is a lot of work. I cannot lie. It is a lot of work, but I love it. And my students are responsive. They enjoy the class. We have guest speakers that come from movie directors, DJs. I had Z Trip come by with his manager last semester. Uh, we have event planners come in. We'll have uh, artists, writers, singers. Any, anybody that's related to the industry will come in. People from casinos will come in and talk. This past semester, I was also the faculty advisor for the Music Industry Club. So that kind of fits in with what I do. And it's just an amazing experience. Last day of the semester, this semester, I brought my turntables in. And I DJed a set for each class. I said, give me some songs. What do you want to hear? Put in a quick set. Dropped a set for like 15, 20 minutes. And they loved it pretty much. So that was cool. Um, and that's what it is. It's, it's a class. Mostly seniors take it that are about to graduate. So we really help them try to figure out where they want to work, what they want to do. I give them career advice based on their LinkedIn profiles. And I encourage them to join MPI or professional associations because that'll be a good foundation for them as they get out to the working world so they're not alone. And yeah, that's that's a quick summary of the class. And we do now I know you wanted to know about, <laughs> about the hotel part. So I'll share I'll share two stories. We teach them how hotels make money and besides just the pretty much standard PL, I go through the star report. So I give them actual star reports. I teach them how to analyze it. Explain what a star report is. So star report will, it's a report that shows how individual hotels are compared to their competition, how much of the market share they're getting compared to their competitive set. So if you have like a Marriott hotel, then how are they comparing like to the Hilton, the Westin, the Sheraton in terms of their rate and their occupancy. And then you take that and get their rev par. And then we talk about rev par index is how that they're, you know, how do they compare to the competition? Are they getting their fair share? So we go through all that and I give them examples on the exam. The first exam, the final exam, they have to analyze a star report. And then also we kind of analyze a group booking. So I'll say, okay, say, let's say Netflix is coming to town, 250 rooms for three nights. They check in on a Monday. They check out on a Thursday. They have peak rooms of 50 on a Sunday and a Thursday. How much revenue is this group worth? 
And then after that, then they continue on. I give them contract rooms. They know about contract. They have airline crew coming in. They'll tell you airline crew's coming in. American <laughs> Airlines is coming in, staying 50 rooms at $99. Wow. Break that down. And then we'll have transient. They know about transient as well. I'll tell them how many transient rooms per night. Say if it's a 700-room hotel, they'll figure out the occupancy for each hotel. They'll figure out the ADR for the week. Then I give them the comp sets occupancy and the comp sets ADR. They have to figure out what the occupancy index is what the ADR index is. Then they have to do the calculation and figure out the ref par and the ref par index. And the what? final question, the final question <laughs> is, is this hotel getting their fair share? Yes mm -hmm. or no? Why or why not? And I always give a bonus question. I say, what's the best case scenario for like the stretch goal for hotels? Because generally speaking, if a hotel is getting 125% like ref par index, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. like, that's yeah, the stretch yeah, goal. Exactly. So they know that as well. Mm -hmm. And they got it. Like on the first test, they got it. And the final exam, they pretty much got it. And what happened is that we had a guest, his name is slipping me, came from Disney Hotels. Okay. And so he did the revenue management. He's like the chief revenue management officer for Disney Hotels. And I said, you know what? I said to my students, why don't you share with him what you know about RevPar and all that? And he, they talked about RevPar and all that. His eyes lit up. So ha he was so happy when I talked about it, when they talked about it. Yeah. So it made, you know, Professor proud. Then on the flip side, also because I work in the music industry now, I talk about how different artists, how they get their royalties, because royalties is a really kind of a hot button in the industry now where, mm. you know, say if you work for a record label and you, you don't even write the song, you might only get 25% of the royalties that are coming from Spotify. But if you're an artist, say like Chance the Rapper or Ingrid Michaelson, when you also you write the song, you sing the song, and you have your own um, record label, that means, just generally speaking, sometimes there's some different anomalies, but generally speaking, you're going to get 75% of the, the pot of money that's out there, and the other 25% will go to like your PRA or whatever, like your Performing Rights Association. And so they go through different examples of that because they love music, and so mm -hmm. they get the chance to wrap her example and everything, so we break it down on the test. They do the math right there. They, they analyze it. It's great. And the funny thing is that I had one student, she, I asked them about royalties or whatever, and what would be the best case scenario. And she actually quoted a J. Cole lyric in her answer, which was right because J. Cole's like the money. I asked them, where do artists make most of their money? And generally, the fact is, most artists make most of their money on touring. Okay. And so J. Cole has a lyric about how you make your money from going on tour. She quoted that lyric in her answer, and that was just, <laughs> that means it's working. What I'm teaching is working because they're relating it to what they hear. Wow. So. That's a couple stories about teaching that in the class. That is interesting. <laughs> that is, wow. I, you know what? I went to a hotel school, and I, I'm, I'm just hoping they, they're teaching that now because, <laughs> I, mean, I hate to say this, but um, most of the stuff I learned, I, yeah. I had to learn, relearn it or it didn't apply. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. and this was years ago. So yeah. you know, obviously we've come a long way. Yeah. And the thing of it is, that story you just, you just explained uh, you seem more excited about explaining it than them, than the students. So because, I don't, I haven't seen the students, but you're, I oh, yeah. can tell that you're excited about I it. I am. And just cause they get it too. Like mm -hmm. they ask, they understand it makes sense. And then when they hear an executive, they all love Disney okay. and they hear an executive from Disney that's talking about it and, and sharing the information. They can actually speak and tell you to him about it. Then they, they really hit some and they really say that I'm just not, teach them things just because it's on the syllabus. Like yeah. I'm teaching them things to use. Exactly. And then we go through, we do two, two group projects. Mm -hmm. um, one project, they have to interview someone who's not really common in the industry. So for example, it could be like DJ Khaled's videographer, or it could be like a performance coach, or it could be like someone who is like a mental health expert because a lot of artists in the industry struggle with mental health. Mm -hmm. So they have to do that. And they have to do another uh, presentation after that where, or group project where, they have to solve an issue. Like one of the issues that we have now is hospitality students don't really want to work in the hospitality industry because they're scared of the long hours. Mm. And so they have to figure out how would they address that issue. Or millennials don't go to casinos much anymore. So what's the issue there? How can they solve that? Or the other issue that was pretty popular is that, oh, Disney is pulling all of their content from Netflix. How will Netflix be able to adjust and still make money? And so they do these group presentations. So most of it's about the topic, but also want them to prepare to do presentations because as we know in our industry we're doing presentations all the time yeah, whether yeah. it be on powerpoint and all that so i really push them to learn how to do a proper presentation don't read from the slides and also be able to answer questions on the fly and so that's kind of another that's probably another part of the class as well too so yeah wow this is that yeah we don't play around Fulton. obviously <laughs> not and they're lucky to, to have you that's for sure and you're going to be teaching again this year yes first okay. day of class is late august august 27th and so yep wow 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 so do you guys get into social media talking about social media at all or is that part of the a little uh, bit like um i really 
really encourage them to really start and become active on LinkedIn. I think for students, that's a really good platform for them to be active on. Like Facebook, that's kind of personal. Instagram is good, but you never know kind of where it will go. But I feel like for students in the professional environment, it's a good start to have LinkedIn because the people that they want to work for more than likely are going to be on LinkedIn first. They might be on Instagram as well, but mm. their boss's boss will probably be on LinkedIn. So it's good for them to start there first and then spread their wings from there. Now, as far as employers that are looking to hire people, are they looking at LinkedIn pages? Are they looking at uh, Instagram pages and all that? Absolutely. They pay a lot of attention to that? Oh, yes. You have yeah. to be careful. I tell them that the first day of class. They be careful what you post, even if you think it disappears because mm -hmm. it can be pulled back mm -hmm. and people will find you. They're now companies, as you know, are hiring experienced social media professionals to do background searches of, you know, potential candidates, social media posts from years when you were in high school, junior high school. I mean, the most popular examples you hear about are like the football players or the basketball players when they get drafted, people pull up like their tweets and their mm -hmm. yeah, posts exactly. from years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. But that's happening for business students as well. You know, high school students come into college, college students about to graduate. I just say, be careful what you post. If anything, create like a super private burner account. Mm -hmm. And, but just on your regular account that's attached to your name, like, just be very careful and represent yourself how you'd want to be represented. Wow. Wow. Well, that's, that's good information for <laughs> all the, the people that are listening that have kids that are in college. Yes. Or, or maybe even the college students that are, that are listening. So that's, this is, man, this is good information. See, <laughs> learning more, more than what I bargained for today. Okay. My mission is accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, if, it, if you had your way, um, would it be, being a professor, you gonna you can pick one. Was pick it a one? professor? Is it being a DJ? You know, twenty four oh. seven. Which would it be? Oh, just pick one. Yeah, you have to pick one. I'll say, oh, I can't pick one. Maybe like I love, love, love to produce remixes. Okay. And I would choose that first because then once I have my own remixes, my DJ sets would be so unique. It would be so memorable. Okay. So. You know, remixes and then DJing, I love that. But teaching, you know, that fills me up as well, too. I can't pick one, but that will be the order right there. So okay. Okay. short order. Now, and you've always wanted to be a professor. Am I right? I grew up, my dad was a professor at Howard University. He's also chairman of the psychology department. Um, unfortunately, he passed away almost 15 years ago. So I grew up in the home of a professor. And so, you know, when we grow up, we kind of want to emulate our parents or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so my, both my parents are educators. And so that was kind of always in the back of my mind and calling me. That's why, you know, I would teach people how to DJ as soon as I learned how to, to do it well enough. And this becoming a professor is, it's really hard to express into words how much it means to me personally. It's not really about the money, definitely not about the money because you don't get paid that much. But just the fact that I'm able to go into a college environment with students who want to learn and teach and have them respond and just engage back and forth and share with them a little bit about my world and let them know. I wish I had a teacher when I was in school that was a DJ, but also was able to teach to let them know that it is a legitimate career. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's okay to be creative because creativity sometimes gets a negative stigma. So I'm able to share with them just a little piece of my world and just show them that it's possible and that you can do a couple different things and be successful. I just, it's hard for me to express into words what it means to me because it's definitely not about the money. It's just the experience of being able to do it and do well at it. I'm continuing to get better. I'm definitely not perfect, but I do well at it where they want me to come back. It, it means so much to me. It's hard to express how much. Oh, that's good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad because I, I mean, you can see it. I mean, I've seen you <laughs> DJ places and I mean, you can just see the passion there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and not just at sports, but, you know, at different events that mm -hmm. I've seen you and I've heard things. OK, <laughs> they're like, oh, no, yeah, you know, Monty's great. No, you know, in fact, uh, Miss uh, Bannister uh, Stamps has yeah. um, when I, you know, I told her you were on the show. And she goes, oh, I love that. Dude. <laughs> that thank dude you. Something else. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So, no, it's definitely out there. It's definitely appreciated. So I, I, I do appreciate, you know, all the things that yeah. you've done. I mean, you're a mentor. I mean, not just to your students. I mean, you're a mentor to me. I uh -huh. mean, and I, and I appreciate that. So I, I, I listen to the stuff you say. There's one quote that I always uh, remember. It's an African proverb. proverb. Right? Yes. If you want. Oh, go ahead. You can say it if you remember it. <laughs> I'll repeat it if not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. That's I use that all the time. <laughs> I think about that all the time. And it's and it's about your circle of people, right? Because everybody needs 
I mean, especially if you're an entrepreneur, if you're in this creative space, right? Yes. You need people around you um, that ne not necessarily think like you do, but are just as creative as you are, right? Yeah. So they're out on this island alone. I mean, you think you're on this island alone, but there's other people, and you can listen, and you guys can listen to this podcast, and you'll see that there's tons of people. There's at least hundred, a yes. hundred of them, right? <laughs> that yes. he's interviewed, right? That are in that same boat yeah. where they thought that they were alone, that they couldn't talk to people, or they're going through the same things that we go through. I mean, trying to grow business, you know, as far as you know. Um, uh, social media, maybe that's a big thing. Maybe they weren't familiar with social media. Now they're getting on there. You know, as far as it's all about marketing, it's all about getting your product out there, your service or whatever the heck it is. So, I mean, those are things that you <laughs> got ingrained in here. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, my brand is as strong because of the stuff I learned from you. Well, so you applied it. So props to you. But I'm glad to share. I think, as you know, being a creative or entrepreneur, it can be very lonely. Like you work from home, you know, it can be very lonely. So we have to find our people, our tribe. Exactly. Um, I think it was Jim Rohn who said you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. So just pick your people and, and stay in touch. Create a mastermind group that you can meet with weekly to talk with and, and just help to share because it's, it's lonely out there. But if you get a good group of people with you, you'll just you'll, you'll grow. You'll grow as a professional as well as personally too. So we can't be it alone. I mean, it's hard, it's hard at first, but that quote says it perfectly. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and him and I, we get together for lunch or dinner yes. or whatever. Probably once, well, not, probably about once a quarter now. Because we used teaching, to do it. Yeah, 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 that whole teaching thing kind of put a damper <laughs> in it. Well, the, when I first started <laughs> teaching, like, it was the, a huge learning curve. It's still a big learning curve. Mm -hmm. But when I, so it was Tuesdays. I teach every, every week, just Tuesdays. I have office hours before. The first semester I was teaching, I taught a class from 1 p.m. to 3.45 and then 4 p.m. to 6.45. So first of all, it's a three-hour class. <laughs> but then this was back-to-back. -back. Oh, my gosh. So then this semester, it switched. Um, thankfully, you know, my department chair kind of said, well, let's try to switch it up, and I listened. So now it was 10 a.m. to 12.45 and then 4 p.m. to 6.45. So they get a good three-hour gap in between. Wow. It's great. <laughs> it's all day, but you prepare. And if, if I'm being honest... The hardest part is the time from the time of class and say 7 p.m. on Tuesday till 11 p.m. Monday night preparing for the next week. Like, cause you got to stay ahead, mm -hmm. got to grade mm -hmm. papers, you got to prepare exams. That's the hardest part I would think. But now I've got two semesters under my belt. So I know a little bit, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, still learning a lot. And at least I can use what I've done to kind of carry it forward and do that. And we always get different guest speakers each semester and we do different events and have a different group of students. So their interests are always different. So it's exciting. Wow. Very good. <laughs> well, oh uh, gosh. Okay. Uh, well, I thank you very much. We're kind of winding down here. We only got a couple minutes left. So once again, I do want to thank you, uh, Mr. Amani Robert Roberts, and you can see the Amani experience. You go to ex Amani experience.com, right? Yes. Amani experience.com or at Amani experience on all the socials. Yeah. So you can get the podcast, you get information on DJ, uh, all the things that he's doing. If you need a DJ, there yeah, you go. Yeah. The, this Give is the call. guy. This is the guy. He's here in LA, but he'll go wherever you need. Anywhere to go. in the world. I panicked a couple of times and called him <laughs> and, you know, like, hey, what do I do? Well, you know, can you help me out? He's like, well, uh, <laughs> kind of last minute, <laughs> but he was willing to help yeah, me out. Yes. But it just so happens we found somebody that was right. a little closer. Yeah. But, uh, but no, he's the first guy I call and ask a bunch of questions. So I do appreciate that. Thank you. Right. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm yeah. proud of how the show is growing. Just keep going. I mean, the hardest part was starting it. So now you started it. So now you're off and running. Keep going. There's two people, you know, I'm just, you know, <laughs> patting you on the back here. <laughs> but there's two people that are, that were influential in me starting the show. Craig Sullivan, who is in Orange County. He has a show called um, Check Out California and you. So mm -hmm. the, you were the two people yeah. when I was going to do it. You're the two people I reached out to yeah, and kind of sent an email mm -hmm. and you, and you both gave me advice on what you should do. And here you are putting exactly. it into action. So, 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 you know, some people told me to hold off. Wait a minute. No, no, I just did it. You know, you just got jumping and do yeah, it. Right? There's no, no yeah. perfect time as you know. Exactly. So, so, so no, but I thank you guys for that and um, appreciate everything you guys done. Once again, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thank everyone for listening and watching. Uh, like I always say, I can't do this show without you guys at least listening, or at least one person. So I know <laughs> one person is listening. Yes. Um, so I do appreciate that. And we look forward to you being or listening to me next week on Air with Russell Potel. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week. Be safe. Thank you.
thank you for joining On Air with Russell of Hotels. Please tune in every Tuesday at 1 p.m. as we talk to other hospitality professionals. Your feedback is important. Email Russell at russell at russellofhotels.com with any questions or suggestions. Until next time, try not to be a person of success, rather become a person of value.